What's going on people? It's me Dessa back with another few minutes on writing and today we are talking about the audiobook. To read or not to read your work? That is the question and the cool thing is today's authors have a say in the answer. You know back in the day in order for our books to be turned into audiobooks we had to hope that a big publisher picked us up and then turned it into an audiobook and have us or some big star like Denzel Washington or Holly Berry read it for us. And back then, everything was produced on this little baby here, cassette tape. And then we got down to CDs. Today, people are listening to books on their computers, iPads, cell phones, pretty much anything that has a speaker, people are listening to books. Now, back in 2006, a woman named Ruth Little John contacted me and told me that she was going to read my book, Water in a Broken Glass, for the Maryland School for the Blind. That was huge. That's still huge. I love the fact that my book is out there. And I'm lo I love that she read it because back then I wouldn't have been able to read my book. Back then I still had a lot of, I still dealt with a lot of self-doubt, a lot of self, you know, not, I wasn't able to read my book clearly and, and with expression and feeling the way I'm sure uh, the way uh, Ruth Little John did. So what makes a successful audiobook? What makes a successful audiobook is the reading of the book. If you decide that you're going to read your book or if you get even if you get somebody else to read it, you have to make sure that you or that person reads that book like they like those people are their best friends. They have to read that book like you have to read that book like you wrote that book. You can't read it as if it's somebody else's work and you're kind of stumbling over it. Now, this is the way I used to read my work. Why did she do it? People who didn't know her would say she did it because she had low self-esteem. They would be wrong. My parents made sure I grew up knowing and understanding and truly believing how beautiful she was as a young, I was, she was as a young black woman, um, wait a minute, she, she never looked in the mirror and thought of her, okay, wait a minute, all right, true, she didn't have a boyfriend, true, she was trying, she was looking for someone to spend the rest of her life with someone who would hold her, wait a minute, and, um, yeah, that's not how you want to read your work. Now, one of the best readings I've heard so far is by is of City of Darkness by Ben Bova, and it's read by Harlan Ellison. Take a listen to how he reads this work. It was only a little past noon when the train pulled into Grand Central Station. Stepping out of the train's clean plastic shell and onto the station platform was like stepping from an art museum into a riot. The noise hit Ron first. There were thousands of people bustling around the station platform, all of them talking, shouting, arguing at once. Policemen in black uniforms and white hard helmets were directing people into lines that surged up moving stairs. People were struggling with luggage. One old man, Ron's father's age, was screaming red-faced at a porter in a ragged uniform who had dropped a suitcase. It had popped open and all sorts of clothing were scattered across the filthy platform floor. People were trampling over the clothes, paying absolutely no attention to the man's yowls. Ron got in a line behind a fat woman who was clutching a six-year-old girl by the wrist. The child was scared and whimpering, I don't like it here, Mommy, I want to go home. The woman jerked the child's arm hard enough to lift the kid off her feet, bending down to push her puffy face into her daughter. She said, listen, you little brat, it costs plenty to get here, and I didn't have to bring you in the first place. Now, you behave, or I'll, I'll sell you to the first meat grinder I see. The child's eyes went wide with terror. For a moment, she tried hard not to cry, but it was too much for her. She burst into a wild, high-pitched scream. Tears poured down her cheeks and past her open mouth. Shut up! Shut up! Her mother hissed at her, glancing around at the crowd. Ron saw that everybody on the moving stairway was looking the other way, trying hard to ignore them. Ron wanted to bend down and tell the little girl that she didn't have to be afraid. But he didn't know if he should or not. So he just stood there while the child cried, and the mother glared and threatened. He felt confused and sad and more than a little guilty about not doing anything to help the child. Now that's how you should read your book. Now I personally have not been able to do that, but Ellison acts as if he's, he's number one, he's acting as if he, he's reading as if he wrote the book himself. So you can tell he spent some time reading the book, understanding the characters, knowing he knows the flow of the book, how everything should be, 
and so he's reading that and may and he's he puts the reader right there i mean one of the cool one of the best parts of the book when he's reading is um when he talks about the woman that, that gets in front of the kids' faces, how many of us have seen that? How many of us have seen a mother that's just aggravated with her child, getting her child's face and say, shut up, just shut up. You've seen that. And so he knows that's how you need to read that piece. Now, he could have just said she got into the child's face and said, shut up, shut up. But no. He wanted us to envision that, to remember the times when we're walk, when we're out in public and we see a mother or even a father get frustrated and just go, shut up, just shut up, you know? So that's how you have to read or somebody else read. Now, take a listen to how Terry McMillan reads her book, Waiting to Exhale. The garage door was up and the car was in it. So Gloria walked across the street carrying the sweet potato pie and rang the doorbell. Her new neighbor answered. Well, hello there, he said. Hello, Gloria said. He was definitely good looking up close, she thought, definitely. I'm Gloria Matthews. I live right across the street. And I just wanted to welcome you and your family to the neighborhood. Well, thank you, he said. That's right nice of you. Come on in for a few minutes. Well, I don't want to intrude, she said, still standing there. I just wanted to introduce myself. Is your wife at home? I'm afraid I don't have a wife, he said. She passed away, going on two years now. It's just me here. Oh, Gloria said. I'm sorry to hear that. Thank you, he said. What you got there? Some kind of pie? Sweet potato. Who don't love sweet potato pie, he said and started laughing. Why don't you come on in and have a seat for a few minutes? I wasn't doing nothing but tinkering with the refrigerator trying to get that ice maker going. You're welcome to come on in. Well, I'm just getting my dinner started and wanted you to have this pie. Then I'll have this for dinner, he said, and laughed again. He had such a hearty laugh, Gloria thought, and such a warm disposition. She really wanted to come in, but she knew it wouldn't look right. And plus, she didn't want to give him the wrong impression, considering he lived right across the street and all. Okay. Now, Terry McMillan doesn't read with, a, with as much um, excitement as uh, Allison does, but she's also reading a different type of book. Allison's book is adventure and and you know so there's a lot of action and things like that so he has to read it in that way Terry McMillan is letting you letting the book unfold um, she does a good job with it though I like I love hearing Terry McMillan read her work I mean I stood in line a whole bunch of times just to go into the library and hear her read her work and you know get my book signed and stuff like that so um, now listen to way Toni Morrison reads her book Song of Solomon Milkman ducked under the boughs of black walnut trees and walked straight toward the big crumbling house. He knew that an old woman had lived in it once, but he saw no signs of life there now. He was oblivious to the universe of wood life that did live there in layers of ivy grown so thick he could have sunk his arm in it up to the elbow. Life that crawled, life that slunk and crept and never closed its eyes. Life that burrowed and scurried, and life so still it was indistinguishable from the ivy stems on which it lay. Birth, life, and death each took place on the hidden side of a leaf. From where he stood, the house looked as if it had been eaten by a galloping disease, the sores of which were dark and fluid. He pushed the door, and it swung open with a sigh. He leaned in. The smell prevented him from seeing anything more than the absence of light did. A hairy animal smell, ripe, rife, suffocating. Then the odor disappeared, and quite suddenly in its place was a sweet, spicy perfume like ginger root, pleasant, clean, seductive. Surprised and charmed by it, he went inside. Mm -mm 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 -mm. I love hearing Toni Morrison read her work. I love reading Toni Morrison's work. She has to be, for me, my the, one of the best writers there is. She is my favorite. She makes me think. Whenever I know I'm being lazy with my writing, I go and I read Toni Morrison and then I say, okay, get up. You can write that sentence a little better than that. And when I'm reading my work now, I'm like, okay, you can read your work a lot better than that. Your readers 
who asked you to come, through, who are coming out to the library to, to listen to you read, who have asked you to come to the book club, they don't want to hear you kind of just stumbling over your words and things like that. They want to hear you read. Now, you can either read like Ellison with full excitement. You can read like Tony Terry McMillan. You can read like Toni Morrison. You can read like yourself. Just make sure you read the book as if you had, as if you wrote it. Okay? So, that being said, I'm going to read a piece from In the Mirror, now that I know how I'm supposed to read. Why did she do it? People who didn't know her would say she did it because she had low self-esteem. They would be wrong. Her parents made sure she grew up knowing, understanding, and truly believing how beautiful she was as a young black woman. She never looked in the mirror and thought of her dark skin, full lips, and broad nose as things to be ashamed of. They were the parts of her that gave her flair. Some would say she did it because she was lonely. They would be wrong too. True, she didn't have a boyfriend. True, she was looking for someone to spend the rest of her life with. Someone to hold her, kiss her, love her. Someone besides herself to look at her and think she was the most attractive woman in the world. But no, she was not lonely. Others would say she did it because she was desperate. Uh-uh, that wasn't it either. Yes, she was 38 years old, and she wanted a husband and a family, and she often wondered why it was taking so long for her to find her special someone. But she was not desperate. She was not willing to take any old dude that came along. Why did Jasmine do it? She did it because she was charmed by the charm in Daniel's eyes, the handsome wit of his tongue. She did it because she enjoyed the delightful sound of his laughter skidding off his teeth, the fabulous way his Adam's apple bobbed up and down in his throat, making her believe she could capture his voice in her mouth if she kissed it. She did it because she relished the delicate way her name looked on his lips. She did it because he was sweeter than chocolate and more interesting, intelligent, fun, and humorous than any man that had ever come her way. Jasmine did it because he had a devastating, arresting body that she wanted to feel all over her, a body she wanted to please in every way her mind could think of. She did it because she loved how attractive, young, and desirable she felt, knowing he was risking everything he had to be with her. She did it because no man had, she had ever known had made her feel so sensual, so sexual, so delicious, so turned on, and so completely turned around. Now Candy, who knew her best, would say straight up, Jasmine did it because I wanted to. That's how I read now. That's how you have to read your work. You have to read your work as if you wrote it. You want people to know that's your work. These are your characters. You develop them. And you know them coming, coming and going. So, thank you for watching. Oh, and if you want to see more authors read their works, because I love hearing authors read their works, go to Odessa Rose, go to my website, www.odessarose.com, and click on the tab that says Odessa Rose Presents the Pitch, and you will see other authors reading from their works. And if you want to be put on that website, just shoot me an email at Odessa Rose 6, the number 6, at AOL.com. So it's Odessa Rose 6 at AOL.com, and I'll put it in the description. All right, so you guys have a great day, and I will see you next week with another few minutes on writing.